Welcome back to the channel. Hope you're all having a wonderful day so far. Let's talk about DraftKings, the largest fantasy sports betting business in the US. One of the obvious reasons a business like DraftKings has such high potential for growth is that it operates within a market that is still so early in its development. Put simply, this is a sports betting phenom in a market where sports betting or gambling on the internet in general hasn't really been introduced. You may be thinking, I've never heard of fantasy sports betting before, and that's a good thing. It's relatively new, but picking up huge momentum. It's big in the UK, and if the UK and Europe is anything to go by, then it has the potential to be a humongous market in the US. It's not legalized in certain states in the US, or only operational in around 9 to 12. However, fantasy sports betting has a different feel to it than regular gambling, with downside being relatively minimized and upside being enough to want to play. Not to mention that it's also really fun, especially if you're playing against friends in a private league. The good news is bills are being introduced and passed as time progressive and people get more comfortable with the idea of sports betting. It's quite crazy to me to think that sports betting isn't legal in a lot of the states as in the UK. It's honestly so popular and hopefully people from the UK watching can vouch for that. Let me know in the comments below. Personally, I don't think it will be long before 70% say of the states have sports betting legalized. And to put a number on that potential, Morgan Stanley are estimating that the US sports betting market will produce over $7 billion in revenues by 2025. That's up from around $1 billion today. So 7x growth in five years. And at maturity, the US market could be as big as $23 billion if Australia and the UK are anything to go by. DraftKings pretty much dominates the US market with FanDuel, their main competitor, a company owned by uh, betting firm Paddy Power Betfair. Collectively, they have well over 80% of the market, with analysts estimating that DraftKings has anywhere from 45 to 49% market share as of 2021. In fantasy sports, users create their own teams made up of real players of a professional sport, such as football, basketball, baseball, and others. Players tend to be limited to major leagues, though, in those sports such as the Premier League in the UK, the NFL, or the NBA. Once they've selected their teams, users can play against each other for a chosen period of time. That can be a day, a month, or an entire season. Players are awarded points based off of certain performance indicators relative to their sport. So that could be scoring a goal in football or, or tackles in the NFL. Ultimately, the points are tallied and users compete against either friends in a private league or against strangers in a public league. Users have the ability to trade off players throughout the season to keep them well connected to the app or coming back online. And this is really good because... It keeps coming back onto DraftKings quite frequently and they can earn money off of ads and things like that. Entry fees range from anywhere from $1 to $1,000 with the company earning its revenue by taking a percentage of each pot. Now, this is interesting because in my mind, it shows the potential to increase revenue take as the business and competition sizes start to scale upwards. After the 2018 Supreme Court ruling, DraftKings added sports betting and online casino. So sports betting separate from fantasy sports betting and then online gambling, casino gambling, you'll know where that is. The company calls this iGaming and they segment the results as such. So we'll get into that. And similarly in this case though, DraftKings takes a margin between the amount paid out and the amount paid in from customers to bet. So a commission basically. So in this video, we're going to look at the company's fundamentals and screen the stock itself to see if it is potentially worth an investment today. The likes of Kathy Wood and ARK Invest have been buying recently and the stock has been on a surge since they posted the 2020 results. Now, let's not kid ourselves. This stock, as many others, are trading at a big premium, even by the likes of Kathy Wood standards. But the business does have some real high growth potential for a long period of time. So we need to see if the numbers can work out. And if they don't, at least we've turned over this stone. So first of all, we're going to scan over the latest results published by DraftKings in a little bit more detail for financial year 2020. Secondly, we'll discuss a bit more about the company, maybe its growth prospects, but more so how profitable can DraftKings actually be? Can it even reach profitability? And then lastly, we're going to be placing DraftKings into a valuation model and return calculation to see how attractive 
the investment looks at the moment. So we start off here, increased revenue guidance to 900 million to 1 billion US dollars. So they've upped their guidance for 2021, which is always good to see. And 1 billion in 2021, or say 900 million, means a 46% growth rate. And 1 billion would mean a 62% growth rate going forward. So it's not anything to turn your nose up at. They've got two non-gap indicators that they look at, and the first one being monthly unique players for the business to consumer segment, and that increased 44% compared to the last quarter of 2019. So on average, they've had 1.5 million unique monthly users engaged in DraftKings each month. And obviously what this tells us is that they've got very strong customer acquisition and people are still, new people are still coming onto the platform uh, and getting exposed to DraftKings. Average revenue per monthly unique players. So this was $65 in the fourth quarter, up 55% versus the same period in 2019. So not only are they engaging more users to come onto the platform, but they're also monetizing those users much more effectively with them spending more during a monthly period. Partially, they put this down to the introduction or increased engagement uh, with iGaming, not just the fantasy sports betting that you'd usually have where they go into the pot, you know, your more basic sports betting as well as your online gambling casino. If we dig into that guidance a little bit more, so they were expecting 750 to 850 million. That's now been put up to around 900 to 1 billion, which will equate to a 19% increase in guidance. So they're obviously seeing something there. The increase is mainly down to the 2020 performance or the fourth quarter of 2020. They're obviously seeing a lot of demand for the products that they have at the moment. And obviously you've got certain states, i.e. Michigan um, and Virginia that are making iGaming and, and mobile sports betting legal or passing bills. So some highlights from the year previously. So DraftKings expanded its footprint with mobile sports betting now in Tennessee in the fourth quarter of 2020. And this launch in Tennessee has had the best two-month launch in sports betting history with over 300 million uh, basically in bets placed in the first two months of operation. They also launched sports betting and mobile gaming or online gaming in Michigan uh, and then mobile sports betting in Virginia, which are going to be two strong tower wins going into the year ahead and even further. Most notably, though, in 2021, you've got 19 state legislators that have introduced legislation to legalize online sports betting. And in addition to that, four states have introduced iGaming legislations and two states have introduced online poker legislation. So that's a big tailwind for that side of the business. And just as a bonus as well, you've got all of these commercial and strategic achievements that you have. You can pause if you want to look at all of them, but some big names out, Philadelphia Eagles, Detroit Pistons, they have deals with the likes of Fox and things like that. So, you know, they've got a big commercial and strategic part of the business. Don't get me wrong, it will cost them a lot of money to make all of these deals, I've no doubt, but it's good for the future of the company. All right, now pay attention. So this is the second part where we look at how can this company become profitable or how long will it take to become profitable? And if I look at the figures going off of what I believe, I think it'll be a long path to profitability, a very long path. So we see here they've got... 643 million of revenue. We've already covered that. Cost of revenue is 45 to 50% of that. So the gross margins aren't amazing. 50% pretty average. Sales and marketing and GNA taking up the lion's share of the costs. 499 million and 430 million respectively. Similar percentages back in 2019 than they are now. I do get that they're going to be spending a lot on sales and marketing and pushing DraftKings out there in a time where they're relatively young and they're in a relatively young market. So what does get to me slightly though is even the CEO says, when we approach a new market or try and enter a new market, we need to spend a lot of money on sales and marketing. And I think we're going to continue to see this trend where they're having to spend more and more on sales and marketing as they approach different or as they enter different states or different markets. Now, they're not just targeting the US, so there is that to think about. They will be targeting other places internationally as well, so they're going to have to spend a lot of money to enter those markets. GNA at 430 million, I don't really like to see the fact that GNA, if we just take 2020 as an example, GNA is almost 70, 75% of revenue, which is definitely not something I want to see. I don't know what 
is packaged into that general and administrative cost, whether that would go down with scale, and it may well do. I mean, definitely the percentage of cost for GNA to revenue will go down with scale. That happens in the majority of companies, but it's a very high number. And I think the way that I can summarize this is that they're definitely going to have a lot of growth on the top line, but the path to profitability is going to be a very long one. Okay, now we get to the most important part. So putting DraftKings into a valuation model or return calculation so we can screen it and see how attractive the investment looks. Just to highlight here, their terrific revenue growth from 2017 to 2020, you can see averaged 42% over that period. Like we've covered, they've struggled on the bottom line. So earnings have been obviously less than satisfactory, but they're a growing company and they're investing for the future, which we don't mind seeing as long as there's a pathway to growth. Shares outstanding have grown slightly, which is understandable. I can I, I see them continuing to grow uh, as time goes on because this EBITDA number, I see it going down. I don't see it going down for a fairly long time. So I do think they're going to eat into their cash pile of 1.8 billion that they've got here. Luckily, they've got hardly any debt, but that doesn't mean that they won't take on debt as time goes on. And I've got cash and equivalents growing at a 5% rate um, because they're issuing shares. They're issuing 1% per year. This is what I've gone with. And then debt's going to be growing at 5% as well. So they are going to be able to raise money from the market. So I don't think they're going to have a problem doing that. As for earnings, honestly, I really don't know whether this company can be profitable in the next five years. I'd say no, they can't. I think after that, they can start to become profitable. And if I take some of the gambling companies in the UK or online betting companies, sports betting in the UK, then you could say their margins are likely to be anywhere from 20 to 25% upon maturity. So I've gone with 25% as my estimation. I'm going to be bullish here. I really do like this company in terms of the growth story that it has and the market that it's in. Revenue growth, I've gone with their guidance of a billion. Remember, trying to be bullish here uh, in 2021, which is 62% growth. And then I've got a sliding scale. It's growing 40% up until 2025, which is the analyst consensus. And I can see them doing that fairly easily with the growth of the market that they're in. Growth slows slightly to 30% for the next five years following that, which is nothing to turn your nose up at. That is still very good growth. And it gets them to around 14 billion of revenue in 2030, which is more than doable on the basis that we're assuming their total addressable market, sorry, their total addressable market can reach somewhere between 40 billion and 80 billion. So if it's at 40 billion, that means that they're still taking around 25% market share. So if it's at 40 billion, it means that they're still retaining a large chunk of the market share, somewhere in the region of 30%. But I think it could be higher, around 80 billion. As this market starts to mature, you've got sports betting, which they're estimating based off of the UK and the uh, Aussie modeling, that it could get to $23 billion upon maturity. That's just for sports betting. And then you've got iGaming and online casinos, which of course is a bigger market in the sense that it appeals to probably a wider a wider scope of people. They think that could be a $40 billion market upon maturity. Sports betting does have some upside. I mean, they actually put in one of their presentations that it's more in the region of 70 billion in terms of what could be the maximum total addressable market. But we're going to stick with 23 billion for now. And that gets us somewhere in the middle of 40 billion to 80 billion. So it's likely they will have some market share taken away from them from some of more competitors coming in uh, or some of the other competitors getting stronger. You've got companies like Pen Gaming that are smaller than DraftKings, but will start to be bigger as time goes on. And so then what I've done with this one, guys, I've tried to keep it fairly simple. I'm just going with an EV2 EBITDA multiple, and I've gone 25 times. So that's quite reasonable for a company that's going to be growing earnings at, at something in the region of 40 to 50% off of that 30% revenue growth, and then a 5% margin uptick. So Quite reasonable if they can sustain that growth for that long a period of time. We may even see that multiple uh, be a little bit higher than 25, but I'm just trying to keep it simple here with this one. And that gives us a terminal value of $89 billion for the company as an enterprise value in 2030. So that's around a three and a half X from where they are now. And so based off of that, we're going to do our DCF as we usually would and look at what the intrinsic value is. So based off of those calculations, and I must mention as well, we're not using free cash flow here. So we're just using a market multiple method of value in the company because we don't know when it's going to be profitable. We don't really know how profitable it will be and, and what period of time there's, there's not much guidance around that. So we're just going to take it out of the equation for now and look at buy price versus potential sale price or potential market cap. And that's what I've gone with. And, and that gives us an intrinsic value for the company of 20 billion 
or $50 per share today, meaning it's actually 24% overvalued. And that's based off a 15% discount rate. So as always, if you're happy with a 12% because you know interest rates are low and you know maybe you're not fussed about achieving over a 15% rate of return like I am, then actually it says that it's fair game at the moment. You know, it's it's around about its fair value based off of these growth estimates. I'm gonna keep at 15%, however. So unfortunately, this one isn't undervalued if I go buy the DCF, which is disappointing. You know, it's disappointing for me because actually I do really like this company. I think it's a company that has a very very long runway for growth and I think the growth is almost a certainty in the sense that they completely dominate this industry that they're in with another company albeit but that industry is so set for growth when I look at the UK market as an example or the Australian market as an example you know this industry is going to grow at a very high rate for the next 10 maybe even 15 years so I don't know if you stretched out this valuation for another five years maybe that would make the numbers work a bit better but you're getting into really uncertain territory there so we're not going to do that what I will look at though is the IRR calculation and if we just get away from the DCF for a moment this will give you a, a, a real hint as to what the expected return would be if you bought DraftKings today based off of those growth estimates that we have. And this is telling us here we can expect an IRR or compound annual growth rate of around 13% over 10 years, which is not a bad return at all, especially for a company that actually has a lot of upside as well. It's a good chance after 10 years, their growth isn't going to be finished with and they can grow further on from there, which takes the risk of the discount rate out of the equation a little bit and also means that they could be priced, you know, a better multiple than 25 times. So to give you a quick idea of if they're at 30 or 35, then you know this stock looks undervalued. If they're going to be priced at a premium for a very long time, we're just going to go with the assumption that they're at 25 times, which is a fair multiple for them, I feel, in 2030. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of upside left. The good news, however, is the markets are a little bit rocky at the moment. Now, I'm not looking at the markets here. I'm looking at DraftKings, which actually has gone on a quite a nice upwards trajectory. But with a lot of uncertainty, it's currently at $64 per share. What's our buy price or fair price? Fifty dollars per share. So, in reality, for a for a company like this that's you know priced at a very big premium, wouldn't be surprised if it does touch that fifty dollars per share again. How far away was we? With? I mean, it was at fifty dollars per share in January. So, I really wouldn't be surprised if it dipped down to that amount again. And if it dipped low enough, I'd probably think about buying this company. It just the valuation needs to make sense for me. So anyway, guys, that's about it for DraftKings. Doing my best to get some companies out there that are good companies that have long runways for growth and, and big futures ahead that do fit the bill. Unfortunately, this one's just a little bit frothy, but I will continue to find some more companies that we can value, we can forecast, and see if they're worth investing your money into today. If you want access to the valuation model spreadsheet so you can make your own assumptions and edit as you wish, put different multiples, put different growth rates in, see if you can make it work. Then you can find it on the Patreon page along with all of the others that we have covered already on this channel and a lot of other benefits. I'll be doing an announcement tonight on the community tab as to how you can join the Patreon page and what sort of benefits you will get in return. So keep an eye out for that. Supports the channel, but hopefully you get a lot of value in return for it. Hope you enjoyed the video, guys. Leave a like if you did. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I will see you in the next video. Good luck with all of your investments.